We express our thanks to the songsters and to all who have provided music today and on Good Friday. This has been uplifting and helpful to our hearts. Thank you. And uh, Begitter and I want to say publicly how grateful we are to Captains Bell for their invitation to us, their courtesy towards us. Uh, the Corps Sergeant Major, Colonel Faulkner, for keeping us on the straight and narrow. And to all of you, uh, we've been in several of your homes, and that has been a special privilege. Thank you for receiving us. And to John and Linda Garrett, and to their loved ones, for taking us in and giving us the freedom of your place. That's been a, a rich, rich blessing. And to be with you again uh, is just lovely. Thank you for all of that and all that you mean to us. Um, this uh, passage in uh, Luke 24 is beautifully composed. You can come at it just as a piece of literature, if you want, and appreciate it in that way. And if you're able to read the original Greek, it enhances it even more. But in any translated language, and our language here today of English and American, it's Keep up with me now, come on. <laughs> it's, uh, it's still equally telling. I can't read it without being moved and uh, encouraged and challenged. Um, there were two on the road, and we know that one of them was Cleopas. And if you look at the order of service for this morning, there's a depiction of uh, the two of them with the risen Christ, and the two of them are depicted as male. And I see no justification for that, because the other one was Mrs. Cleopas. Okay? And I'm saying that to get all the ladies in the congregation on side here. All right, but why not? Why does it have to be a fella? Uh, why not Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas? <laughs> Or even Brigadier and Mrs. Cleopas coming back, <laughs> coming back, coming back from the, the big events in the capital city. Uh, I like to picture it that way. There's no evidence for it. I have to be candid. You know that. You can see through what I'm saying. Mrs. Cleopas, we don't know. But you don't know that it wasn't. So I'm going with that just for now. Is that all right? Keep with me. Um, we know that the second person, the second unnamed person, was not one of the 11 because they were in Jerusalem and they're mentioned at the end of the narrative uh, and the two rejoin them and go back to them. Now it was very late in the afternoon and it was resurrection day. Everything had happened that day. Okay, so they're still uh, on resurrection day. And here is the risen Christ turning up on a dusty highway when nobody expected it. Uh, you know, when you're a cadet in the Salvation Army's training college and wondering if they'll ever commission you and will it ever end, <laughs> and you're wondering when they'll deploy you, they teach you how to preach, and, uh, well, sort of, and <laughs> they, um, they tell you to have three main points. Kind of tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you've said. That's the kind of three, <laughs> three main points. But when you get elected general, you're allowed four. <laughs> Okay, I'm sure it's in the regulation somewhere, and if it isn't, it should be. We see Christ, our companion, okay, 
Christ our counselor, Christ our courteous savior, and Christ our comforter, our companion, our counselor, our courteous savior, and our comforter. Christ our companion, let's think about it for a couple of minutes. It seems that he's an awkward companion. Uh, sometimes when I read this narrative, I end up thinking, heavens above, what if I'd been walking and he came and he said these things to me? Uh, he's very candid. Uh, he asks pointed questions. And the first question he asks them is, what are you talking about? What's your conversation about? Now, that's not polite. In British culture, you don't do that. I, I don't know what you do here. Well, I do, but, uh, or some of it. But uh, we Brits were very reserved. You know about that, don't you? You've heard of this great famous reserved uh, thing in our disposition. And we never butt into anybody else's conversation unless it's absolutely essential, okay? Uh, and yet, here is, here is uh, exactly that happening. What are you talking about, he said, as you walk along? Now, it strikes me that if anybody has a right to ask you that question, it's Jesus has a right to ask you that. What are you talking about? What, what are you saying? And what use are you making of the gift that you've been created with, the gift to communicate, the gift to use words, the capacity to speak, and the capacity to write, and the capacity to send emails? You do this, you do this stuff, do you? And, and, and this stuff? Yeah, get over it. Get a life. Get back to the fountain pen and the ink and some decent writing paper and keep the postal service in business. It's, uh... <laughs> well, now, I'm content to be asked the question, sure, uh, what use are you making of the gift of speech that I've given you? Why are you talking the way you're talking? Why have you said what you have said? Sure, why that tone of voice? Why that uh, in, your, in your mood? Uh, say less, sure, say less. Pipe down occasionally. Take a back seat now and again. And remember what it says in the epistle of James about the use of the tongue and what it says about those of us called by God into a, a speaking and teaching ministry. It says that those of us who exercise a gift of spiritual teaching will be judged more harshly and more exactingly than the others. And James says, therefore, not many of you should do that. Not many of you should become teachers of spiritual things. Now, you need to pray for me because I'm up here exercising that right now. The more you say, the more likely it is that you will fall into sin. So let's be perhaps sensitively economic with our words. What are you talking about, says the risen Christ? He's a beautiful questioning companion. He's a listening companion. He's an outspoken companion. He says that they're foolish for not understanding. This is the directness of the risen Christ. Christ our companion. Then Christ our counselor. I don't want to say too much about this. He explains the scriptures, the scriptures. He's the clarifier, Christ, the clarifier of God's word. And I want to ask you this morning, 
this lovely congregation. Thank you for coming to God's house. I want to ask you, if I may, uh, are you familiar with the Word of God? Uh, do you have one? Do you use it? Where is it? Uh, do you bring it to the meeting? Do you open it in the meeting? Uh, are you searching it? Are you growing deeper in your capacity to understand the Word of God and asking the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, to be your clarifier of the Word? And through that means, to allow the risen Christ, uh, through the Holy Spirit, to be your guide and counselor, you and your Bible. Uh, where would a follower of Jesus Christ first instinctively turn when needing guidance? Not to the Reader's Digest or something like that. I think the Scriptures is our instinctive first port of call. It's God's Word. It's the inspired and authoritative Word of God. And here is a wonderful, eternal resource for our guidance and our counsel. Christ our companion, Christ our counselor, Christ our courteous saviour. In verse 28, you know very well this famous, famous, often quoted uh, statement that when they got to the house in the village, Jesus made as though he would continue on NIV says Jesus acted as if he were going further. That's very powerful. It shows us a great deal about him. Um, he made no, no arrogant assumption about his right to go in. He, he, he was a respecter of their privacy. And that hasn't changed. That's never changed. You have a right to privacy. It's an innate human right. You have a right to privacy. And even the very God who made you and who made me accords us an innate human right to spiritual privacy. And he's not going to kick down the door of your heart or mine. I remember reading, oh, when I was young, heavens above, how long ago was that? When I was young, I read the writings of a man called Richard Wurmbrandt, uh, a Christian pastor and evangelist in communist Romania. And uh, one of the points he made was the contrast between the courtesy of Christ and the, the discourtesy of the government under which he lived and their agents and their military and their secret police who had come and kicked down the doors of people in the middle of the night. And Wurmbrand makes a very powerful point, Jesus is not like that. Not like that at all. And you'll have seen Holman Hunt's famous Light of the World painting where the risen Christ stands outside your heart's door, my heart's door, waiting for admission, and there's no handle on the outside. It has to be opened from within. The courtesy of Christ. Uh, what's, what's in your mind's eye when you're seeing them uh, at table in the house in Emmaus. I have a print in our apartment in London, in Beckenham, which is a very posh part of London, till we moved in and lowered the tone. <laughs> and uh, this print shows three at table, three at table with the Christ in the center and the two either side. And in, deep in the background, in the recesses of the painting, is a vague figure whose 
waiting upon them. I don't think it was like that at all. I think it was a family house. I think they went in and here was an unexpected guest. Now what do you do? You panic. Okay? But a sanctified panic never hurt anybody. <laughs> sanctified disorder can be very creative. You can discover new gifts. Okay. So here is the savior of the world <laughs> coming in for supper. Imagine children. Imagine some uh, animals, chickens, other smaller beasts perhaps, running around the floor, scuttering around, and uh, people rushing to get pots and pans and food and beverage ready. And there in the midst of family life, normal everyday family life, is my Jesus. Their Jesus, your Jesus, sanctifying by his sacred presence the whole scenario. Is your place like that? Is that what it's like where you live? And where Pegitta and I live? Christ at the center of everyday, ordinary, Christian, human life. Oh well, Christ our companion, Christ our counselor, Christ our courteous savior, Christ fourthly. Is it four? Christ, are you keeping up? Christ our comforter. Yeah. How our hearts burn within us. I don't want to say any more about that. Because I've got a fifth one up my sleeve. <laughs> um, let me put to you briefly a fifth uh, before we do some praying together. This is, you see, this, this reference to how their hearts burned. And as a result, they had to get up. They couldn't go to bed and settle down and start snoring or whatever people do in bed. They had to get up and get back seven miles, seven miles, striding out in the darkness back to the city. The impact of Christ upon them uh, as he broke the bread, as he presenced himself they felt called into further action. And so here is the calling Christ. Now I know, I know what it is to be called. My whole life stands upon that rock of a sacred calling. And let me tell you, uh, it came a long time ago. Uh, I was 12 years of age. Now, now picture this. Short trousers. Okay. School uniform. This is Britain. It's Scotland. It's Glasgow on the western, southwestern coast of uh, Scotland. It's Glasgow. It's a place, it's a, a suburb called Park Head. And my parents were captains, Alice and Albert Clifton. Alice was Alice Shaw and married Albert Clifton. That solves a lot of problems for you. <laughs> and they were stationed at Park Head and we lived in Tennyson Drive, named after the great poet. We lived at number 64. And I would go to school uh, through a beautiful park called Toll Cross Park. And uh, I was coming home from school, a leather satchel on my back with the evening's homework and prep for the next day. I was alone. 
It was a nice day. I emerged from the park and I turned left to go over a short rise in the road and crest the hill and go down ready to turn right into Tennyson Drive and the first house on the left was number 64. Our quarters, it had 12 rooms in it. Wonderful for a child. You could lose your parents easily in a place like that. <laughs> Come out of the park, I turned left, and I got to the crest of the hill, and just before turning into our street, uh, someone spoke to me. They, they spoke to me by name. They knew my name, Shaw. I was alone on the road. And uh, one day, said the voice, you are to be an officer in the Salvation Army. I was 12. It was plain, it was plain, it was plain. I didn't feel excitement. I didn't feel anything. It was just matter of fact. I kept on walking. Um, my parents had taught me and my two older sisters, I'm the youngest of three, Sylvia and Mary were my sisters. They had always taught us to listen for the voice of God, like young Samuel was taught. A couple of days later, I told my parents what had happened. And my Irish mother, she was probably ironing or something like that at the time, said, oh yes, son, uh, God often does that to people. And that was the end of it. <laughs> How wise she was. How wise. I was 12. Years went by. The years went by. My parents were moved around by the army. And we found ourselves in London uh, shortly after that at, in, northern, in a northern suburb of London called Edmonton. And in the core at Edmonton was a family called Ashman. And their daughter was called Helen, Helen Ashman. And she was two and a half years younger than me. And uh, I loved her from the moment I saw her. We uh, fell in love, we married. We were active in our corps. We wore our uniforms. The tall ones, you know, with the stand-up collars. The uncomfortable ones. <laughs> Thank God for this, whoever invented this. Deserves the order of the founder ten times over. Then uh, we were in a divisional youth council's meeting can I say that and be understood? A gathering of all the young people of the division, the East London division. We were in a town hall in a place called Ilford. And today my son, John, my youngest, John Clifton and his lovely wife Naomi and uh, their eight-month-old daughter Miriam, Helen Clifton, are living and working there, leading the corps at Ilford. And we were in Ilford Town Hall all those years ago, Helen and I seated side by side, and it was the third and evening session of a Sunday of divisional youth gatherings and celebrations together. And there was a commissioner on the platform, and I can't tell you his name. So I'm not naive about these things when you get up and speak, because it's God's business, not mine, or the commissioner at that day. But he was inviting people to come and commit their lives, and uh, I didn't go forward. Helen didn't go forward. Uh, my head was bowed, and the voice, the voice spoke again. Helen was teaching. Uh, she was finishing her professional training as a teacher and moving on into a teaching career. I was uh, teaching law in a university. 
and loved it and was fulfilled. And the voice said, uh, this is the time. Uh, you have to, you have to change everything now. Everything up till now has been uh, preparatory, but now you must come. And I knew, I knew this was uh, the voice when, when I was 12. I knew what that meant. And uh, I was older now. And so I said, uh, if I come, will it be all right? And the voice said, yes, it will. And the voice said, you've seen your parents. You've seen their godliness. You've seen their dedication. You've seen their pain and their hurt sometimes. And you've seen their struggle and their frustration sometimes. And you've seen that there's never any money. You must come. You must come. Well, I'll spare you the rest of it. Except to say, I had to tell Helen. And... Uh, we had a little mini car. You have minis here now in the States, I see, don't you? We had one of those. It was maroon, and we drove up to a high place before we went home, and we sat in a dark place, a dark, high place overlooking North London, and I told her what had happened in the meeting. She said, yes, I know. And she just said, we'll do it together. It was as simple as that. We'll do it together. So now I draw a veil over what happened next in the car. I leave that to your imaginations, vivid imaginations. The calling Christ. Now, how about you? I know some in this meeting may experience that same call. But I'm talking now, this morning, as the meeting concludes, I'm talking about someone who's not saved at all. And Christ is calling to you. Come. It's today, it's this morning. Now's the time. Come, come, walk with me. Let me be your companion. Let me be your counselor. Let me be your guide. Let me be your savior from sin. I did it for you. Don't you understand, he says. I did it for you. Don't be slow to understand. I did it for you. So first of all, this morning, I want to ask, is there anybody here in the meeting who has not given themselves away to Jesus Christ, then now is the accepted time to do that. You can do that. We have a place of prayer. Just it's so simple and so plain. And you're invited to come. There's going to be music. I think we'll sing all my days and all my hours. Can you do that for me? Yeah. All my days and all my hours. All my will and all my powers all the passion of my soul. I invite you to come and use the mercy seat. Come, give yourself to Christ. And others of you already committed and seasoned, seasoned in the faith. Resurrection Day is a great day to come. And just say, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And be humble in his presence. So these next few minutes, are for you in that way. Let's lift it up together. All my days and all my hours my will all the passion of my soul
We'll sing the chorus again, if we may. And uh, then the meeting is open for any person present to speak to God in prayer on behalf of all of us. Just rise in your place and speak from your heart. We'll be helped and blessed by that. Let two or three pray. Let each heart respond. All my days, what does it mean for you? All my hours, all my will, my, my decision making, all my powers, my abilities, the skills I've got, skills with my hands, skills with my mind, skills with my body, my whole being, all the passion of my soul, all of it shall be thine. Risen Christ, dear risen Christ, shall be thine. Let's sing it again, and then let there be prayer. All my days and all my eyes Thank you for that prayer. Let another pray, just from your heart. Be free to pray.
Loving Father, we Loving Father, we gather up all that has taken place here. I thank you for these lovely people who have come into your house. I thank you for tender hearts, responsive hearts. We praise you for who you are. We bask in your love. We rejoice in your Holy Spirit. Send us forth from this place full of resurrection joy and a beautiful, beautiful, renewed spirit of holy obedience and courage. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we have a closing song, and Captain Bell will lead us through that. Thank you, Captain. <laughs>